Guys, it's just Katie and I. Get ready for utter chaos. Guys, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, your host, Maria, and with me today is the one, the only, it's not Will, that's who you were expecting, it's Katie! It's me! And today, we are reading Sword Heart by T. Kingfisher. I'm interested to get everyone's feedback, because I did see a lot of, like, different opinions. I haven't read any of it. Uh, yeah, I always, I, I like to go in and feel the waters, like see where I'm landing. I like going um, in completely blind. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a little bit of introduction, this got nominated a while ago for one of the book clubs. And I remember looking at it and going, that sounds really interesting. But at the time, I thought like, I don't know why I thought he was going to be in the sword more like, like she was going to be like communing with the sword and he wasn't going to be like a physical man. Um, and like, the, it, I, I don't know why, but I expected them to like commune through like mental thoughts and stuff. And for her to fall in love with just the like Zompacto idea. style. Zompacto yes. style. Exactly. Zompacto style. That's a bleach reference. Finberg says, if this is the kind of dynamic is your thing, I can see how this book is the most delicious junk food. It is. Oh my God. So everyone, I want you to know this is my kind of thing. This is the type of fan fiction I live for. I also like a whole lot of other stuff. Don't get me wrong. This is not my favorite type of writing, but my God. Mm -hmm. Delicious. I will say for me, like I did enjoy it, and there were times where I was having a good time. But unfortunately, like I, I like my romance much more like the romance in Nettle and Bone, which was much more. You would have enjoyed the shit out of that book, Katie, and I actually would love for you to read it. Uh, it definitely it needed. The first half and the second half were two different books, and I... That's what Will said. I enjoyed the shit out of it, and uh, I would read it again in a heartbeat. Um, but the romance was much more, like, secondary to the overall plot. Which, yeah, which I prefer, know, personally. Um, I don't usually, like... Well, if... Uh, okay. If I'm going to fall absolutely head over heels for a book, but also respect it, I really... Like, like as a piece of art, then it's not going to be the first thing. Um, however... If I want to escape from my mundane worldly woes. This is my kind of beach read. Yes, this is perfect. I will say um, I couldn't put it down for a hot second until they got I know. The I know. Oh, you know? Listen. You know where I'm going to say where it happens? I have my point at which I, I, was, I wanted, if I had a physical book, I would have thrown it. What point? No, you go first. You mentioned yours first. Okay. Um, it was when they got back to the house, sorted everything out. And then the stupid miscommunication. And then Sarkis was like, here's my past in history. And she was like, oh, she would not have cared. She would she not have cared. Not have cared. <laughs> Thank you. This annoyed me so much because like it made no sense for her to care about. It's Korean happened. drama. It's Korean it drama style it's, stuff. It, but it's also, it's like, it's like the author. Cause one of the things I liked about uh, Nettle and Bone, as far as the romance went, is it didn't have like a, it didn't follow the plot line of a rom-com. And unfortunately, this had a third <laughs> act miscommunication. The third act breakup, and then they have to come together. And... Oh, so dumb. And that's the type of stuff that, like, honestly happens, like, slightly... Like, even... I First of all, I don't even want it to happen. Especially with the setup the way it is. But, all, but if it is going to happen, it's got to happen, like three-fifths the way through the plot or something much earlier or like two-fifths two-fifths through the plot and then they work over and then the trust continues by the way i'm dying angry otter oh my god but what if this is just the transcript for a middle-aged couple's ddlg <laughs> role-playing adventure i could see it valerie says i said it was a beach read by the bed is my bedroom and the sand is the mysterious crumbs in my bed <laughs> Miss Alex knows says, yeah, King Fisher was more worried about following the rom-com beats than making sure her character's internal motivations made sense. And this is exactly what happens. And it really just sucks because, and it was so funny. There's a, I, I literally was in my head going, this is just like a nice, like, cause I've seen so many people say cozy fiction, like slice of life feeling hobbity fiction, like hobbity feeling books. And like, the ones they've mentioned, I'm like, I don't get that vibe from this. Like, that isn't the vibe I get. But this book, I was literally like, it's so cozy. And, like, it feels, like, slice of lifey, but, like, in a hobbity sort of way. And then an angry otter was like, how are any of these elements getting trapped by your family, considering killing yourself to get out of being trapped by your family, cozy and slice of life? And I was like, fair. It is, though. It No, but it is in a funny way. It's, it's yeah. low stakes. 
It's low stakes, which makes it cozy. And Grotta was saying was that for them, it would be high stakes. Like those things are all high oh. stakes. And oh. um, and so like, in, and it's- Yeah, depends, but I want like, a little bit of edge and allure in my romance, you know? For me, what it is, is that the tone of the book like was so laissez-faire and like chill about it that like it made it so that it didn't feel high stakes but it did feel very like it did i don't know why but it felt slice of life like a like a little travel montage you know like the whole thing (laughs) (laughs) miss allie's knows it's the lighter side of internal servitude and suicide again it's kind of like the same kind of thing where it's like Oh, I don't know. Sword Art Online. (laughs) There you go. That's a pretty messed up concept if you ever watched the show slash read the manga. But yet, it's it's kind of rom-com-y. Not that I like it at all. I hate that show. But um, no offense to anyone. But yeah, like, I I really like, again, uh, I really like the light tone too, Valerie. It just, there were some times, like I said, where it just got so repetitive that like these silly little like idiosyncrasies were just a little too much. I will say right now, because I'd like to state up front who my two favorite characters are. Do you have any favorite characters? Maria? Yes. Yes, I do. I want to hear yours first. Tell me who No, you favorite. brought it up first. You can't, you can't. Listen, I'm sorry. I'm being polite. I'm inviting I, you to my party. No, no, no. You go <laughs> first and then I shall attend. First off, I cannot for the love of God remember his name. I even multiple times repeated it to myself so I would not forget and yet I still forget it. But Anol is my Brindle. favorite. Brindle. Brindle, thank you. Uh, Brindle is number one best character up against a hard, hard neck and neck you know what i mean with the bird (laughs) the bird was the best part of the whole fucking book to me i mean don't get me wrong zale's great but the bird the worm we shall all fall within the darkness of the worm listen that i i have some issues with like some of the voice actors uh chosen voices but uh the the tones for the bird were just Very good. So there are some things in this book where she decided to do something. And I'm like, that was so good. Like, good job. That was a great idea. I really love that you came up with that. And then again, as we've already previously stated. And so I will make the point that Lindbergh makes, which because I I agree with you. I'm so disappointed the bird wasn't plot relevant. How is the bird not fucking plot relevant? Look, she left it on a cliffhanger with that dumb second sword thing. So, you know, I like... If she doesn't take up on the opportunity to make the bird, maybe it's like, you know, a slow burn for the bird. And in the second book, the bird, but for the love of God, I thought the bird was going to, because he collected weird things. So I thought for sure this bird was actually like, had like could do something or was intelligent or was the key to unlocking something. And no, it's just a bird right now. She needs to do something with that. I kind of wish it was a standalone. Like I don't, I'm so tired of things becoming series. Like I, I sometimes I just like a good standalone to let it sit. But Me one too. of the things I will say is, so we'll start with overall comments then we'll go to uh premise and then we'll go into plot summary and kind of go from there. Um, But just as a little premise thing, this book is about a, widow a 36 year old widow whose um uncle by marriage uh she was living with taking care of after her husband died he decided to take her in and take care of her he was an eccentric old man who collected weird things and uh he ends up dying and leaving his entire estate to the main character halla her other relatives by marriage are very insulted that the man they were actually related to left everything to this random widow who, you know, they just married a son to. She's only she's only the person who took care of him when nobody else yeah, would. Yeah, for like the past 12 years. Her family decides to make her life miserable in an attempt to get her to marry her cousin, Alver, uh, who has clammy hands. Very important, mentioned multiple times. Okay, look, the clammy hands repeat with, uh, with either Zale or Sarkis would have been funny, but not everyone agreeing that he has clammy hands. Uh, there are some comedy beats that are just a little like, oh, come on, that's not going to happen. Leave it be. And also, for me, it, it's just the kind of thing where I would have preferred if it had just happened with Sale um, and uh, that kind of thing. But it just, like, I don't like when characters, especially, like, someone in Alver's position who has obviously been controlled and like molded by his mother so much like I would have liked it much more so the problem with this book one of the problems overall before I finish the premise is it's just very simple 
we're not going deep. Alvar is not a complex character that we sympathize with as well as we hate. But he should be. He fucking should be. I thought for certain when he came into the room towards the end and sat on the bed with her that he was going to be like, so it's time I stop listening to my mom and then go and do something. And I thought there was going to be a moment where she's where he'd be like, go, Hella, I'll hold her off. And it was going to be like really funny and lame. It's because he's a bumbling idiot, but so is his mother. Do you know what this reminds me of? Huh. So there is a book I love near and dear to my heart. And a movie was made of it. And everything in it got turned into like shallow caricatures of what they were in the book. And everything became simple and campy. It is Ella Enchanted. Mwah. Oh yeah, Fucking I remember. Excellent, excellent book. I loved you the went shit off out of on it. this in high school. I hate the movie, and yet the movie was well thought of. And, it, and for me, it's like Char in the book, the Prince Charming character is like complex. He's a little nerdy, and then like they were just like Prince Charming. We're gonna make him good looking, but also maybe kind of smart. And I, I was just. And Alver and a lot of the things around the two main characters. Oh, look, I have people supporting me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Ella Enchanted. Justice it's a, for Ella Enchanted. It's a well, it's a well-known thing in like the book. I not that I ever read Ella Enchanted. I didn't really watch the movie either. But all of my friends that liked reading, um, because I hated reading when I was around that age, um, they were all like, oh my gosh, Ella Enchanted is like moving. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then as soon as the movie came out, they were all really butthurt about it. Oh. And I was like, uh, okay. It was a flattening and a commercialization of the book. They had to make it as, and because part of the problem is a lot of the stuff that happens in the book is internal. And that's not good to watch. So they had to make a lot more external conflict, conflict and issues. And like, just pick a different pick a different book argument make it into a musical so that way you can turn it into internal thoughts on the outside they almost did it anyway exactly and it's just like it's so annoying but anyway the point is i think this book is a flattening of what could have been an epically good book you know like this is the ella enchant and here's the thing i will say ella enchanted is like a well-loved movie. There are a lot of people yeah. who like cult classic wise when they've never seen the book before, they really enjoyed the movie. And so, and as someone who enjoyed this book, I just look at it and go, if this is the Ella Enchanted version, what could it have been? And once again, fucking T. Kingfisher getting this out of me. I'm like, let's fucking rewrite. Let's go motherfuckers. Like I, I could think through how to like, yeah, elevate I, this i know and you know what the, the thing is is like she i really like what she's it's a she yeah yes i think there's some things that she incorporates that i just think is really fresh like for example the bird like while it's not crazy fresh to have something like that happen it is really fun i like the dichotomy of the 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 like weird hellish hellfire stuff and i really liked the i i zale is great um, I love Zale's character to pieces. I like the idea that he's a lawyer, or that, excuse me, they are a lawyer. And that, um, but then, like, again, it's almost like she has these really, really pretty gemstones. And she has an opal. She has a fat opal. And it still has the geode in it. And so it's like really naturally pretty, but really rough around the edges. And you can't wear it as jewelry. But she, she can. I know she has the capability of making that geode into an opal that is shined in, into a wedding ring that you yep. just get married to a book with. Part of it for me is it feels, and I, I don't want to make this comparison because it is nowhere in this league, but the intent of it feels like when I was reading Ice Planet Barbarians, no matter how much I was having issues with it, there was this sense that this is exactly what the author wanted to write and they yep. were enjoying the shit out of the Good writing. for them process and i get the feeling that that was ha happening and i just i do mourn angry otter makes the point i get disproportionately oh, enraged yeah. by wasted potential and that's why this book pisses me off so much because there is this cute like cozy vibe to it but i think that it could have brought it higher to have it a little bit less flat to make some of the side characters a little more nuanced and also so rarely do i want things to have so i was recently watching our flag means death and which I watched it oh my god katie i know you told it. me you told me Why? it's so fucking i just finished season two it's so good i fucking love it um but there there's a point where in a really darker show about pirates 
like pirates. Uh, what was it? Was that the one with uh... Black Sails? That one? Yeah, Black Sails. If it had been Black Sails, there's this one point where they like do something against this one woman who's this pirate queen. And I was like, in a completely different series, she would now be after them for revenge. And this small action and misunderstanding would turn into a huge issue down the line. Um, and I was like, I really don't want that to happen in within this show. And it didn't because the show's like the show's like, hey, hey, hey. It's it's a it's becomes a breakup conversation that people have to then deal with as a form of communication. But like that's that show. And in this, I wish there was more things that had a little bit of consequence. Like I, I was actually looking for after they killed those two priests, I was like, are there going to be no I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine with that though, because the comedy beats for that shit was hilarious. No, it what was. I got what I got frustrated, I okay, there I mean there's obviously multiple things. But I think one of the biggest again it for her, it wasn't a slip. But for me as a reader, uh, what I personally subjectively wanted was the Vagrant Hills to mean something more. Um, as much as I enjoyed like what happened. Fucking sequel bait. Oh my, like, yeah. Like I just thought it was, I thought it was very boring. Uh, and there there could have been so, like, it, it, it had insisted that the Vagrant Hills were, like, curious about Sarkis. And so I really wanted there to be, like, this eldritch or whatever. I don't care. But, like, if the, if the hills themselves are, like, you know, uh, sentient, then it is qu kind of eldritchy uh, in a way. Um, but I just really wish that that had something it was really fun the glass things but they also felt very like out of place in this world it felt very D D, and 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 at that point between and again this is fine because again it's the author she wanted this it's fine but it felt very slapdash how you know uh non-binary people and all these different things are just readily accepted which is fine, again, but also it's like, it feels weird. It feels like a rock in my shoe. A widow, a widow who sleeps with someone isn't? You're telling me we've accepted as a society non-binary people and weddings between, because there's that line at the end about weddings between, but but God forbid a woman sleep with someone outside of marriage. That's what we've held on to as a society. I know, isn't that wild that it's yeah. just like, uh, they have all these things, but then that's normal? And again, that's fine, actually. Like, I I'm, I don't mean to nitpick that. It's because you can have a world like that. Who says there wouldn't? We don't have to have the basis of what we have in our world. But no. at the same time, with the with the conventions that are just imprinted in my personal brain, I just feel like it's that comboed with the the paladins, but then also lawyers, and then also little people that are like little animal people um, that have a caste system, and then the glass things in the vagrant hills and all this, and the sword thing, all of that, and, and the artificers and, and everything. Between all of that, I felt like I was reading a D and D offshoot. I'm gonna make a point because I just want to clarify, just in case, because there, in our last video, uh, Gina made a point and it didn't get clarified as much as it should have. Um, and so I want to clarify here. My, I think the representation in this book, and for the most part, the society is really good. I love Zale as a non-binary. Oh character. my god, me too. It was in great. In fact, one of the best we have ever read because it's just like wonderful and wonderful the idea that like they have a little plaque on their desk just that says they would like to use the polite form of address and it is just the polite form of address to use they them and it's it, like the book doesn't talk about it the book doesn't like nope. sit there and, and i like, like that i do like you know, that and i love that that's that's how i like i i like these things to feel natural and in that case it felt natural what Katie and I were saying was the weird part is that like women sleeping out of wedlock is the weird that's, thing. See, that's so. the, the combo between that. But again, again, if that's the world we're going to inhabit, who cares? I really don't have a problem with it. It's just something that is like floating, you know? But for me, there was a huge stretch of the book where it didn't feel outside of. So there was a point in the book where I felt like, okay, the only real magic is him because everybody keeps reacting yeah. to him like, whoa, buddy. This is the weirdest thing we've ever heard. And I'm like, if magic exists, then listen, you might never have heard of a man trapped inside a sword or a man trapped inside of anything, but it felt really uneven where for a while it felt like Fantasylandia, where it, it felt like um, a world in which a magic might exist and where there were these like different tinkerers and different things, but it didn't feel like magic was an active part of this world. And so then to get into the vagrant hills and hills that can just grab you up with these like flying like, globby monsters 
felt, as Katie said, super D and D. They seemed very sci fi. You so know what I mean? So for me, they felt like almost like uh, what are those things called? Like mimics, I know, but yeah, after mimics, they're mimics. Turn in. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they're like they just don't disguise themselves as anything. They're just mimics without the disguising factor. So it felt super. Like and and so there are points where it just felt really and and then when the gnolls appeared and again Brindle is one of my favorite characters but I was just like we didn't hear about this the entire first half of the book that there were non humanoids out here just living life technically the gnolls get introduced in like the fourth fifth chapter or something like that I, I don't know somewhere early on when they get into the the first city thing and uh. They are walking in and they see one walking and uh, Sarkis is like, oh my god, what is that? I still feel like that was way later than it should have been. Like, too much of the book had gone by. What should have happened? You know how she mentions later on that there are the uh, sewer ones in her, in uh, 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 Rutgers, whatever the heck, her, her, you know, her hometown. Yeah, Rutgers house. Well, that when she's walking or running, oh, better yet. When Sarkis and her are running away, they encounter one doing sewage work. And then Sarkis yeah. is like, oh my god, what is this what thing? Is that? And then they have that we, conversation. Exactly, because uh, unfortunately, the world just felt like it was... It felt very... Someone uh, just said... Oh, was it a quarter? Science right? Fantastic said there was uh, a low fantasy vibe to it. And there really was. And so then for these real high fantasy elements... Um, and so Lindbergh says... I'll admit some of these world building elements were really cool. And they were. Yes. And I wish we'd got more world building. The plot is a little too. And then this thing, this thing showed, showed up. up. Yeah. And it really um, is. For me, this book has, like I said, there's a general feeling of flattening to a lot of things outside of the main two characters who I think the author is trying to give a lot of depth to. Uh, Lindbergh made earlier a point that a lot of Sarkis's really dark thoughts felt tonally out of place in the rest of the book. And it, it is shit the, the first moment where you realize oh they were stabbed through the heart with like hot steel violent like real dark um and so i will agree with that but i would say with hala and sarkis there was an attempt at depth and and a little bit with zale but everything else in the book is almost cartoonishly flattened yes and again it it fits into that campy tropey like uh, kind of if you took a princess bride princess bride and like an anime and you smooched them together that's this book ta-da that's it unfortunately i as a reader like a little bit more like again we were talking about cousin alver i wanted him to have some depth uh, aunt, aunt malva i was okay with her just being a crotchety old white woman not that we know she was i'm pretty sure she was white but i, I was just okay with her being a crotchety old woman um who just thought about her son but I wanted some depth from some of the other characters and um, it just, it's not there. And so there, there are issues with this book, but it's, if, if you're, if you're in for this kind of cup of tea, it's not the greatest cup of tea ever, but oh, it's going to hit some nostalgic cozy buttons. On the mention of the religions, I really wanted that to be more involved, especially considering um, later on how the, saint of the sword stuff comes into play mm -hmm. i really liked the politics between it i really liked i liked the slow build of the interactions between them. like for example I, maybe some people didn't like it but i personally did where they were on the road and then those two um hanged mother uh guys kept bothering them and each time they tried something different i really enjoyed that and i would have preferred maybe like that being involved in some way with comboed with the vagrant hills and then it you know and then the plot get deeper but again, it's whatever. How many? Oh, we have 15 now. Look at that. Hi, guys. Ooh, we're carrying um, it, Katie. Who needs but, William? <laughs> well, we do. He's the one that's we do. the stream. We can't. We can't. <laughs> Katie we couldn't even set up the stream by ourselves. He, he, he texted me earlier this morning and was like, can you do the stream? I was like, I don't know how to do it and connect it to YouTube. And he was like, okay, I'll be there. Hey, Katie, do we have a Patreon? Do we have a Patreon? I think we do. Rhea, why don't you tell us about that Patreon? I shall do it. Number one, this is one of our Patreon live streams. One of the perks for our, our second and third tier patrons. Twice a month, we do live streams uh, to discuss books with our patrons. You guys get to watch them afterwards, like this video. Uh, this video has been really fantastic. We've had a lot of good input from our patrons, and we've discussed with them. Join the book club or our Parasocial Darlings tier 
for this perk. Also, if you join our base tier, you just get to be part of our Discord. Our Discord is a good time. Are you a writer, a reader, or someone who just likes talking about nerdy things? Join the Discord. It's a great time filled with great, sexy people. If you're a writer and you want to get to the nitty gritty, some of the more minute details of writing, you should join the Critique Streams, part of the Parasocial Darling tier, where once a month, Katie and Will look at a passage or chapter of a book and deconstruct it for why it works on a mechanical level. Katie brings the grammar and knowledge of what actual writing concepts is called, and Will brings all of his opinions. It's a good time. <laughs> so you get primetime material like that if you join our Discord or our Patreon. Or, I mean, you join our Patreon to join our Discord. Also, Katie edits. If, if oh, you God. want your writing edited. <laughs> yes, but currently, <laughs> currently... I, I don't have any uh, uh, openings until January. So if you need to uh, publish, and it's this year, I, I'm not your gal. However, if you are casually chilling on your book, shoot me a message at beta reading by Katie. Yeah, at gmail.com. And I guess I'll pencil you in for January. Hi, guys, and welcome to another Indie Ad Corner, where we introduce you to indie authors uh, who are trying to get their books out there into the public eye. This week's video is sponsored by Nathan Phillips, The Devil's Descendants, A Grim Beginning. For many millennia, the living have feared the Reaper, but it's not the Reaper that should be feared, but what they protect you from. Plagued by a dream telling Lily her missing sister, someone everyone believes is dead, is still alive, Lily drags her son Alex across the state to her sister's old home in the quiet town of Salem, Massachusetts. But quiet towns can hide loud secrets. With the aid of an old friend and secrets hidden within the walls of her sister's home, Lily reignites the search for her sister and the one responsible for her disappearance, unaware that they are already coming for her and Alex. But while Lily is dealing with a mess of her own, a terrifying incident brought on by powers he inherited from his mother leaves Alex trying to come to terms with who and what he is. But balancing his newfound knowledge and the day-to-day -day life of an ordinary teenager only grows more complicated when Elena joins the mix and even more so when she is suddenly taken from him. Battling monsters, crossing dimensions, and not to mention making a dangerous deal with a witch in their search for Elena, Lily and Alex both hold nothing back as they rush to save her. But how far are they willing to go? How much are they willing to risk? Would they kill for her? Die for her? How far would you go for the ones you love? So if you like the sound of reapers, angels, and monsters going head to head across multiple dimensions, The Devil's Descendants, A Grim Beginning, might be the book for you and is available through Amazon in both ebook and physical copies. Now back to the video. I want to premise now, or even though I should have done it earlier, that as we're discussing this, these are nitpicks in my opinion. This is like polishing until you can spit shine it and see like your pores in the reflection type of stuff the book is good you will enjoy it if you like this stuff please go enjoy it it has its faults who the heck cares if not every book has to be a picasso however that being said we do this for the purpose of spit shining things so Bear that in mind. Thank you. I just wanted to mention that. I will say that while I think I think this good is like m mid to fine range, but incredibly enjoyable. I wouldn't say that I would put it in the good category myself. The mid to fine range is where I would put it, but enjoyable. Uh, and I think a lot of people Which boots will it. really- it's one of the modifiers that boosts it up into a good realm. But I just, like, I wouldn't call it. I'm too nitpicky with my uh, categorization. I, I wouldn't, it like, it, it wouldn't get to go up there for me personally, but that I, I wouldn't say that. I'm a like, lot, you know, I'm a lot more lenient. I, yes. I can enjoy chocolate ice cream. I can enjoy vanilla ice cream. I can enjoy blueberry ice cream. I can enjoy a great many flavors almost equally so. So I am not a picky eater when it comes to a lot of stories. However, that does not mean uh, that I do not notice uh, how one taste is more uh, more in depth, more, more mm, 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 creamy. This is homemade ice cream, not yeah. not Publix ice cream. So I would say toast wise, this is this is what it is for me. It is a dry it is a drier, not completely dry, whole grain, whole wheat piece of toast 
that has some Nutella on it. Oh yeah, that's 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 fine. Uh, yeah, it's I don't I wouldn't say that. It, whole grain infers there's some there's some matter to it for me. I would say this is white bread. Um, or potato bread with a little bit of cinnamon Fair. sugar and butter on the top. I, I would say I would say probably not butter. Like we were out of butter. We couldn't afford the richness of butter. That fair. But there's some cinnamon sugar. <laughs> like, yeah, there you go. I'll take very light, airy <laughs> white bread toasted with some cinnamon sugar on top. It's not that meaty. It's not perfectly toasted. Uh, but, but it, it's there. I want to highlight a quick comment that someone made. Ice Willow says, and I think this is super true because it, it's also true for the other book we read. One of my favorite things Kingfisher does oh, yeah. in her books is the very funny religions that nevertheless are the most serious thing on earth to their members. So you have like the, the, the rat God. And then in her other book we read, it was the, uh, Lady the of Dream the Crackles. One? The uh, nettle and bone had a nunnery, but it was Our Lady of the Grackles. I love that. <laughs> it was great. Listen, I think you would really, if you like this, you will love nettle and bone. Like, nettle and bone is going to fucking do it for you. One aspect of her writing that I really like is that she assumes her readers, in maybe not all places, but she allows them to be smart. So, for example, um, you know the part with Bartholomew uh, when uh, they're going um, to the white rat? and uh temple and he's like oh well albert's not too bad you could like you can tell that he's like kind of like no go with your family and then as soon as she comes back and i figured he would have something to do with the sword stuff it was kind of on the nose and uh when when uh she comes back he's like oh yeah your family sucks and i was like all right so he's in on it like uh, which i but but hella didn't or n nobody was like ah there's something fishy here, so I appreciated that. Yes, she doesn't. She doesn't play it completely. Obviously, she does try a little bit to be like to tell the story and let the reader be figure along it out for the ride. Um, okay, so we do have to get into the plot. Uh, finishing the premise, which I started a long time ago. Uh, she finds an enchanted sword on her wall when she tries to uh, escape her reality in a physical way. <laughs> My, by the way, guys, during this part, she, uh, for those of you who are listening who have not yet read it, she's like, my boobs are quite big, so um, I have to take my top off, so that way I don't accidentally just skewer the breast and not, like, take myself away from this reality. And uh, I really, I thought that was, I like those little quirky things in this because that's true! I liked that, but I also, just in retrospect, like, having finished the book, it just feels like an excuse for Sarkis to see her shirtless. So, and then she has a magic sword, and her and the magic sword go off on a quest to uh, help her get her property back and get rid of her annoying family. That's the premise of the book. I started it an age ago, we're finishing it now. Now, the actual plot of the book. As said, her uncle died. She's been in this house forever. Her terrible Aunt Malva and her terrible co cousin Alver are there. And they're like, Mary Alver, once you have kids, it'll be fine. Because they, they want the money. They want the house. They want the money. And they're like, bitch, you have to shack up. And she's like, no, Alver has clammy hands. Which everyone in this world knows is the absolute highest thing you can commit when courting a woman. And also, um, along with Aunt Malva and, uh, you know, Albert... Um, there are also two, uh, I'm assuming it's uh, Malva's like two sisters or something or, or aunts or something, but we have two old women who have knitting needles and one sleeps on a bed with four quilts on top of her. Um, I did like little details like that throughout the story where she was like, oh, this must have been so and so. It's because there's four quilts on here. Paula is like, no, I'm not going to marry him. This isn't happening. So they decide to lock her in her bedroom. Uh, and she's in there for three days and they're just trying to like bully her into agreeing to ma marry Albert. And he keeps coming up and being like, listen, I know my mom's real or the, the audiobook narrator gives him a real like annoying dweeby voice. I don't like uh, this. Yes. And like, like, listen, I know mother is really hard to deal with, but it'll be easier once we have, once children. we have kids <laughs> and, um, and she's like, Get away from me, you clammy-handed freak. Anyone who happens to have naturally sweaty hands, I apologize for the absolute slander this book is going to put you through. 
<laughs> as someone with clammy hands. Um, and the idea is she is a respectable widow. She hasn't been, her husband's been dead for 12 years. She's been living here. You get the idea that she's not got a lot of experience with the opposite gender, though it, it, it is implied that she's like into the opposite. Like, like if given maybe a chance. So, uh, lo and behold, what happens when you are a topless woman trying to spear yourself through the heart with a sword, and when you finally get the sword out of its sheath, a man pops in and goes, so. Technically, he says, aghast, woman, put on <laughs> some clothes. <laughs> and I, I did appreciate that. As soon as that happened, I want you to know, uh, uh, my husband works from home some days, and he was um, he's on the, the, the queue, so he answers calls, and he was on a call. And I was vacuuming the, uh, the stairs, which is right outside his office, and his door was open. And when that happened, I was like, <laughs> and uh, uh, I laughed so hard because I had my earphones and I didn't hear. He literally rolled outwards and was like, what are you <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> Shut up. I'm working. Basically, what then ensues is a long conversation that takes a really long time for them to get to the point of, oh, let's escape. That was so irritating. Yes. I, that is one of the, I will say that it is, like, as far as a meet cue, it should Weakest. be short and sweet. It is so annoying. This conversation we have. I mean, I really like the, the, the punctuated ending where he's like, wait, you're locked in here? I really enjoyed that. That was funny. Yeah. And that made sense because how is he going to know that she's a prisoner there? Because she hasn't explained, but she... Why didn't she immediately? Yep. Why wouldn't she just be like, oh my God, you're a man and you look muscly. Dude, get me the heck out of here. And you've just said you're sworn to me. So basically what, what is she doing? Is instead of a man popping out of a sword and going, hi, I'm, a ch I'm an enchanted sword. I am now your guard. I'm sworn to protect anyone who draws the sword. That's you now, bitch. And instead of her being like, <laughs> perfect, I exact, I know exactly what to do. I have, I have a plan. It, like, instead of any of that, she's like, you're in the sword? How long have you been in the sword? What is it like being in That's the dumb. Sword? It's so and dumb. She just, she just starts, and so one of the things we learned about Hala, and it works in a lot of the other scenes, but it does not work here, um, is that when Hala is nervous, she asks a lot of questions. But listen, I understand being nervous and wanting to distract yourself so you ask a lot of questions or being anxious or in pain and asking a lot of questions to distract yourself because that is how it is used later in the book. There are multiple points where she is either in a situation where asking questions is going to uh, off-put someone and thus like delay something. It is, it is used as a tool to distract herself from her aching feet there are a ton of times where it is adequately used as a character like uh, like this is who Hala is this is how she deals with stuff because of who she is um but in this moment it makes no sense because like you should be going for absolute clarity as soon as possible and not tangent i'm nervous so in order to distract myself i'll recite the history of this world so i don't know if you guys remember but that happened in fourth wing fourth as wing. well and it doesn't work as a, a concept and the two of them like just have like this like really long back and forth over and over like question thing and basically because he's like well do you have someone who can come because she's like, my family's trying to force me to marry this other guy. And he's like, well, that's no good. Do you have someone who can help you? And instead of being like, no, I have no one that is going to come to my rescue. She's like, well, I have my two nieces. And he's like, can, ah, uh, shield maidens, can they fight? And she's like, well, they're 15. And he's like, 15 year old shield maiden, still a shield maiden. And instead of being like, we don't have shield maidens here. They are young girls with no, like, and she, but she's entertaining it. Like, there's this point at which, like, instead of, because like, he is the magic man who has popped out of sword and has told you what his deal is. It is not on him to understand that, like, you have to explain. And it's just. It's a little yo, bit much. It's not. So anyway, yo, let's move past this scene, yes. though, for the love of painful. God. We're now but mimicking anyway, the nature of the scene. Towards the end, she's not just like, hey, they're trying to force me to marry this guy. But she confesses that she is locked in the bedroom. And he's like, oh, so they are holding you prisoner. That I can immediately, because like he's trying to play within the family politics, but from what he knows from his society of how to work through like this kind of dilemma, because he, 
he now serves her whatever she need he gonna do but he like also like what's not going to put pit your family against you unreasonably once he finds out that they're locking her in the door then he's not too worried about pitting her family against her they've done that himself and he's like escape plan miss Sally snow made a good point too it felt like the whole long conversation was just so kingfisher could establish that women can rescue women they don't always have to rely on men that feels very real actually that that really makes sense because why else have this conversation he's there to serve her why does she, why do they have to re rely on her nieces but immediately after this m one of my favorite scenes of the entire book happens which is you know she gets ready and everything and then uh as they get to the door he kicks it open and she's like the lock didn't budge the the uh the hinges didn't quake the entire frame came off the wall and went against the <laughs> and I was like, I love it because that's how anime is that? She's just really good at those little details that yeah. like add to the story. It's a, a thing that we saw also in Nettle and Bone um, where those tiny little details make things work. One of the things I miss though from Nettle and Bone is the creeptastic factor. In Nettle and Bone, there's a woman with like a monkey doll that is like got its cord around her it's the creepiest thing on the planet katie it's so creepy it is so off-putting and creepy just read it please do me the favor it was so good anyway and like this this book i went into this thinking there was going to be some kind of creeptastic factor and there is none at no point are you like oh hey to be fair to be fair the glass jelly things uh falling and wanting to get inside of you uh, so that way it could, that was close. That was close. And I would say the worst part for me was seeing it slide off of that deer. That, yeah. that was worse and seeing the deer walk weirdly. But again, like it, it, her skill at atmosphere is completely lost here. Like we don't, you and I say that because it's really good in the other book. In fact, I would say one of the problems with the other book is it's so good in some scenes and then in other scenes you're like, is this the same book? Uh, but anyway, uh, so they bust down the door and he's like, how many guards does your aunt have? And she's like, there's one. <laughs> And so, like, immediately, Malva and Alver hear them and are like, and then he duels with their guard. It was, I mean, I wouldn't call it dueling. They're going down the stairs and he ends up fighting the guard. Um, and uh, the guard's like, I really don't want to fight you, man. And Sarkis is like, I do not want to fight you. The, the voice actor gives him, like, a Scottish brogue. Sarkis was cursed to a specific image the entire book because of that voice. I want you to know, okay. God, it ruined it for me. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the voice. But because of the connotations, you know the movie Brave? Oh, yes. I pictured the father as Sarkis. Oh, no. Which really is, took away a lot of the attractive moments for me. Because I was like, and I got major daddy vibes because of that. Angry Otter also got daddy vibes because of how overprotective he was. I tried so hard to abandon that image it's because he doesn't even have orange hair but i just like it haunted me i don't know why but it haunted me i got more of um how to train your dragon gerard butler's character but like a hot version of gerard Butler's oh my god character. me too that's the same problem though you know what i mean like i just yeah. i see and a actually, big cartoon I nose and first more like outlander because like in my head he was just like hot older guy like burly older dude but like scottish some people are agreeing uh i cat says i really didn't like the voice the unscottishness of this scottish voice was just off-putting and i will say it did feel like a bit of a an attempt at a shorthand to go for like they were trying to give the idea of like the swordsman the otherworldly swordsmen so they kind of leaned into what culturally like in our day and age like outlander is pretty big you know it's it's got the vibe Lindbergh <laughs> says is no. this what you were no ice willow why are we pretending the dad from brave wasn't hot what does he look like i don't know if i remember give me one moment i shall look, i shall make my verdict look okay look you i really felt attracted to what's his face from How to Train Your Dragon, the dad. Uh, okay, so I'm not saying oh, that no, cartoons I, can't I, be hot. Listen, this guy is. 
I know, but that's just absolutely okay. No, but I'm just saying it just it made it unsexy for me because I just I associated it with like 14 year old, 15 year old me or whatever, whenever Brave came out. And I don't know, it just there was like this weird cartooniness that haunted me for him. Ice Willow, you are not incorrect. He he daddy. But <laughs> also, I just didn't want to be imprinted from another piece of media either. But it, God, it just did it to me. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> I'm coming into my Williamness in his absence. Lindbergh says uh, his kind of overprotectiveness is such daddy vibes. At times, the romance was cute, but at other times, I felt strangely grossed out by it. And that's one thing that I wish was a little bit lighter, is that it was less overprotective father at some points, and a bit more just, like, observant, like, what is she gonna get into? Like, instead of, like, I can't let her get into anything, just like... Well, I mean, it kind of plays into the hand of, like, he's the servant of the sword. He has to serve... The sword handler. Yeah, it does. It really does make sense. But what I didn't like was, I mean, the thing is, is you can make the things I don't like work with some of the logic. So, for example, I was not overly pleased with how quickly they started having the hots for each other. But why wouldn't they? I mean, he's attractive. Hella's single. Hella's probably wanting to boing a little and uh but it takes her a little while longer because she lies to herself sarkis celibate for ages why wouldn't he want to boing her like so it makes sense but it's just like at the same time it's like but i don't like it doesn't for them it's like it's very like knight and my lady so it's like that feels unprofessional in a way. Yes, <laughs> it does. And I think part of the problem, and this is something that Angry Otter just said, I primarily got grossed out by the thirst. Sarkis thinking about Hala's nipples. And I would have liked so much more if it took way longer for her to see her sexually. Like, if he was just a little bit blinded by duty, and the fact that yes. he's been in the sword for 500 years, uh, and so he didn't think of nipples and need to go, like, take care of business i hated no. that i <laughs> hated i hated that he got hard on the wagon and had to walk i hate that he went to the outhouse to masturbate that made him way too human to me hey Rihanna makes a point it should have been a more chaste romance and it should have until it wasn't you know like it should have been like for the first there should have been no thoughts of any no nipples no hard dick and it should have just been like electric like i'd like to just touch her like like the like yeah. they touch and it being like cause again i'm a slow burn bitch i do not want to hear about how you thought her we should get a t-shirt like that i'm a slow burn bitch I am the alliteration I want that. That can that be too. one of our merch pieces. Lower Whenever we make Lower. enough money to do merch, yeah, for sure. So I did not like that. That's something that. And so as we're going through the plot, as they get on there, God, we haven't exited her fucking house yet. We're 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 doing so good, William. Right, as you edit this, aren't you so proud of us? We're an hour in. Okay, we? let's. Well, okay. luckily, awesome. luckily, luckily, a lot of it's traveling, so we can jump through it a little bit. He wants to motorboat her. Oh my god, I know. He's like, he didn't know whether he wanted to cover, uh, he he wanted to cover her cleavage because her bodice was too revealing, and he was like, and he was like, he was like, he didn't know with his hands or with his face, and I'm like, come on, are man. Are you a frat boy? Are you 18, Sarkis? Like, my god guy calm down listen i understand 500 years without no nookie is like it's a while he wasn't even awake for it though and his yeah, body's yeah. not the same body as it used to be so who's to say that the fa pheromones <laughs> that the uh you know what i mean uh but who's to say that he would even i mean look i can't say that <laughs> What were you going to say? I was going to use someone I love very much as an example. You can't do that. For example, someone I love very much uh, that uh, also went through a long celibate time didn't really want sex. Now, granted, this person is, like, not exactly sexually motivated, but, like, it took a hot minute to be like, oh, yeah, that works like that. Like, I... Oh, okay. Like, ah, I remember what it's like to... Also, Sarkis is old. Just like this person, I love very much. <laughs> I will say that the person I know that I love very much, who is also old, 
doesn't have that problem. We can't make daddy jokes. Anyway, continuing on past people Katie and I know. So they end up leaving her house. Like he he has a fight with a guard. He stabs the guard. They end up leaving the house. Uh, and they basically decide they are going to like they they run as far, fast as they can to escape the const the constables. And then while they're like in a ditch somewhere. He's like, we need a plan. We can't just aimlessly go around. He's like, can we go to your family? She's like, no. And then basically their plan is they're going to go to Amal Cross, which is this one city where a friend of her uncle's, who she knows, still lives. And the uh, hopes that if she offers once everything is legally dealt with, him first pick of the wondrous items her uncle collects because they were friends and they traded a lot with each other. So he's also an artifact collector. And he's also like the grossest, honestly, more gross than Albert, honestly. I do not like this old man. This old man is so boring as a character. And it could have been better. Like, I would, I wish you could have felt a genuine affection for Silas. Silas or Bartholomew? That Bartholomew felt like he had a genuine affection for Silas that colored oh. everything he did, you know? Because, like, if they had Ooh. been friends, you know, because then it would have brought some complex again. Wait, didn't he leave everything to Silas, too, at the yeah, end? he did. And so, again, I wanted to, like, I wanted some guilt in his face. I wanted some complexity, and we just didn't get anyway. We're we're jumping too far ahead. Great opportunity for same sex relationship in elder age representation, especially as like two people who knew they could never live with each other. Yes, and then and then the death and the, uh, the greed from Silas overcoming because it's a relic, a holy relic of his. And, and not just that, but maybe he was expecting his stuff to be left like that. Bartholomew would leave his or that Silas would leave his things to Bartholomew and he's insulted that he didn't yeah after year like oh god that would have been wow again I would love a rewrite video for this book because I think a lot can be done while still because like I really enjoyed Nettle and Bone but we did a rewrite video because there was some things that like the potential we thought could have been expanded on and I think you can do that with this book as well without insulting this book and just say here's a different way you can do this thing but anyway continuing uh, so they're going to go to Amal Cross, visit Bartholomew, her uncle's friend, and then they're going to go to um, the main city, whose which name I have forgotten. Um, An Anuket? Yeah, Anuket something city. like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was Anuket City. Um, and they're going to go there to go to the Temple of the White Rat uh, because there's a bunch of different religions in this world. Um, there's the Hanged Mother... There's the God of Men Which Arms. I really, again, great aspect to the writing. I loved the Hanged Mother, and I liked that we got that throwaway line. Granted, it was a throwaway line, but I really liked the idea behind her was awesome that she hung her, wait, uh, what was it again? There there was a, a somebody, a murderer or somebody, and she hung herself to do something to get justice or something i don't remember yeah. but it was really interesting with her own hair which i thought was super cool kingfisher has a great eye and hand for religions and making them odd and and some of them sound ridiculous but really interesting like by the end of it you're like yeah the rat has many eyes motherfucker fuck with the rat god you know i also like, love the explanation too that even though we might forget the rat even if we do forget the rat at one point the rat still exists. It'll scuttle into the into the you know the world and still observe us from afar. And I really like that concept. It's because what better way? I mean, not that I like rats being associated with lawyers per se. Like I mean, that's kind of on the nose. But I I I really liked I I liked how practical they were. I loved the the bear lady person, the bishop, great paw or great bear or something like that. Bear paw, I think was her name. Any, but the point is, she's great at religions. But the rat, she she for the most part, it, there's a point where he's like, "Why are you going to this religion compared to any of the others?" And she goes, "Well, they're problem solvers. Like they're not like dealers in faith. They're not miracle workers. They're not gonna like slay a demons, but they will help two people who both think they have the ownership of the same tree and its fruits." mediate that and, and so it's basically a temple of mediators lawyers like and problem solvers which i just love because that's a really fantastic that makes sense and it's so interesting that that is something that is like instead of being like a shitty like a conniving job it is a act of faith and and working within a system i, I really like that 
Lindbergh makes the comment, and this is going back to what we were saying about the characters and Bartholomew lacking death. It's like only our four main characters get to be real people with real dimension. The rest were just caricatures acting whatever way the plot demanded in order to keep the book alive. And that's what I mean by that flattening. Outside mm. of the main little group, everyone else is just flattened out. And unfortunately, unlike the Princess Bride, where everyone is pretty much flat, like, and that's the camp of the thing, you can't have, like, some of the characters feel real and have depth, and then everyone else feel like caricatures. It just feels a little... Now, granted, it, I, unbalanced. It, it's really what makes the unbalance, in my opinion, though, is, like, Bartholomew, Silas, like, that kind of, those kind of characters, not the characters like the, um, the paladins felt real. The paladins felt great. I loved them. They were wonderful. I, uh, I thought, you know, some of the other side characters that you only briefly meet, like, so for example, like the woman that lives across the temp, uh, the, the local temple or whatever that keeps giving Hela advice she doesn't want. Like, that's all very quirky and real feeling. But then it felt like, wait, all that quirkiness and realness is given to some of these throw, like genuinely throwaway characters, but not given to those other characters. And I feel like it's because it's just supposed to be an easy, like evil, this is bad, this is yep. good battle. And unfortunately, one of the things about cozy reads or things that have this kind of cozy tone is it's supposed to feel a little bit more like slice of life. And so like the the villains should feel slice of life. They should feel like someone like you've met that person, like in Bartholomew's face, you can see an uncle or like a friend of the family that did hurt you and betray you because of some petty mishap, um, but isn't necessarily a completely bad person. In a Malva's uh, witchery, you should be able to see that one member of the family that only thinks about themselves, but has real quirks to them. In Cousin Oliver, you should see someone that for the most part you're disgusted by, but is disgusted by themselves and dealing with their own stuff. And that's the problem, where you have this tone that is trying for cozy and slice of life, but with just such characters of bad a caricatures of bad characters that it just it breaks the feel of it and it like it, there's a moment where you're like is this fantasy landia or like is this a hobbity it's like what is happening and it just doesn't work side note Lindbergh had mentioned that the paladins were cool but their role was so small that king fixture didn't need to act uh they didn't need them uh for the plot i really feel like and again it wasn't necessary. The only reason I felt like she put them in there is one for the little cameo bit and also to like have fun with that religion part. Um, and then uh, two, for Hella and Zale to get to um, the Amel's Cross or whatever quicker. Um, but then my question became, because uh, it really got po uh, pointed at when uh, they mentioned it, they were like, uh, when the paladins were like, it's gonna take you four days to get there with this ox and I'm like, why did they not hire a horse? Why did they take the ox? They know time is not on their side. They're trying to get to Sarkis before anything goes wrong. Why didn't they buy a horse? Because that would have required leaving the ox, which uh, Brindle wouldn't have wanted to do. Brindle could have stayed with the ox in, uh, uh, you know, her Rucker land, blah, blah, blah. Like, they could have just stayed there. There was no reason for them to go. They're too slow. Why didn't they just go get, like, it just, it just didn't make sense to me that they would take the ox of all things. They decide to go on this course of paths. They end up traveling. There's a point where Hala goes to an inn after, like, days of, like, sleeping in bushes and hedges and uh, stuff. And she's hungry. She goes and she eats. One of the things you discover about Sarkis is as long as he's in the sword, he doesn't need to eat or do anything. If he's out of the sword, he will get hungry, need to use the facilities, all that jazz. But if he's in the sword, he's fine. So she, like, she's the sword, goes in. And she ends up getting a, uh, m m she's a mark for a bandit group who like sees her eating by herself and is like, we'll mess with her. And then Sarkis pops out and is like, least favorite fucking character was Mina. My God. What a woman, not for woman. What a, what a bitch. <laughs> they continue going on and they end up going to a Malcross. They meet uh, Bartholomew and Bartholomew's like, oh, hello, what are you doing here? Oh, I heard about your uncle's death. And, and she explains the story. And at first, he's like Katie mentioned before, because we've really talked about a lot of this book out of order, um, that he's a bit like, well, you know, is it so bad to marry your cousin Alba? Uh, and it, he's like her uncle. He's got a lot of stuff. He's got a lot of weird stuff. And like, 
you, his rooms are cluttered. So when they end up getting a room for the night, it's really like cluttered and stuff. And he immediately is like, hmm, that sword is... Because one of the problems is if Halas sheaths the sword, then Sarkis will go back into the glade. So they have to wrap it with a rope right in between the hilt and the um, pommel uh, so that it won't close. So they put a rope there to keep it. And he notices and he's like, "That's that doesn't look original to the piece. Oh, why have you tied it that way? And she's like, oh, it, it gets stuck in the, the sheath. Uh, that's what I meant between the sheath and the, uh, pommel. Um, and, uh, like, if it's not there, it gets stuck and it's hard to draw, so we leave it like that. He immediately is like, uh -huh. you see his little, like, uh, collector boy hackles raise, and he's like, uh -huh. is that, um, uh... um, and he keeps asking about it, and you're like, oh, this is gonna be a problem. But anyway, they go to the Temple of the White Wrath in, uh, Anuket City, and uh, they meet with someone named Zale first. There's a point where uh, we mentioned this before, but on Zale's desk, Zale is the first priest they kind of deal with. Uh, it says a uh, polite form of address, which is the they them, which is a really just nice, easy way to uh, include that uh, non-binary people are just a part of this world and that this is an established way that you know if somebody like how they'd like to be referred to which was it was just super subtly done the book doesn't linger on it but anyway they have to explain like he's a sword this is the whole thing and like she's really there to help get her inheritance back from her family but everyone just gets real sidetracked by the sword and then the uh, priest is like this is above my pay grade I gotta take you to the bishop the bishop does like has a conversation with Sarkis by himself and then has a conversation with Halla by herself and is basically um when she's with Sarkis she's like I'm gonna ask her if you're like uh if she'd like to like leave you and not have you anymore but I would like to ask you are you being are you a slave are you being I held? liked that I, I do as well um are do you need to be rescued do you need us to get you out of this sword like what can we do and then to Halla they're like <laughs> the minute she she says she's like are you being held a hostage are you okay are you allowed and basically both of them are like no I'd like to stay together Halla does not like the idea of selling him because she's like he's a person like he might be in a sword but he's he's got like will and stuff like that so no i do not want to uh sell that guy that's that's not my that's not that sounds like slavery this entire time he has been kind of thirsting for her as we mentioned before where like stuff happens and he's like <laughs> and he is like there's a point where when they're at first at Bartholomew's house she has to wear like basically one of his night shirts and an old ceremonial robe but it makes the the ladies very visible and he's like i wonder what it would feel like if i put my finger across what? and i'm like sir <laughs> sir calm down thine you, lines you are you are working i don't know how he got away with this whole adventure not according to him getting hard in front of hella like the entire uh, he, time as he says he has no cod piece specifically pointing that out to us readers that he has no cod piece and therefore you can see his uh uh, his own sword. There's never a point where it happens that's insane. They basically are both like, no, we'd like to stay together. And at this point, Hala has also noticed there's a point where he takes his shirt off and she's like, Damn, Oh my. Daddy. So they're both at this point kind of feeling the feels. He's he's feeling for Hala more than just, um, like he's, he's had points of admiration because she, like she's had to like, uh, after this, she has to haggle for clothing. And he's like, man, I didn't know she could use her dumb questions for haggling purposes. And so they're beginning to have mutual respect for each yeah. other. Uh, all that jazz. Uh, so yeah, they, they leave the temple. They go to get her some clothes. They get in for the night. And then she decides, because one of the things he's mentioned is he's from this place called the Weeping Lands. And he doesn't know where they are, except that they're definitely north of here or when they were. Um, so she's like, why don't we go to the library and talk to a scholar and see if we can figure out how long you've been in that sword. And he is like super touched by this. And it's a really nice gesture. Yeah, it was a really nice moment. And it totally makes sense for Hella to be like, oh, we're near a library. Let's do this to waste time. Like, that makes so much sense. And I really liked that he got to go place himself and that that was see from that point on, I feel like attraction not like nipple wa nipple rubbing and like m I want to motorboat her stuff, but like that's where he should start having the kindled flame of affection for her, and then like really starting to like z 
you know, feel the water. Not yet, not yet. He just feels the affection and the respect from the moment that Maria just mentioned. He likes when, like, she holds his hand and he just really likes that feeling. Like, God, do you not know how to write a slow burn? Like, get it together, people. She gets clothing. They go back to the... Uh, and she changes, and this is the part where the bodice she's now wearing, because before she was wearing a habit, like, for mourning, and now she's not, number one, not in black, number two, in a bodice that does a little lifty lift, and this is the part where he's like, cover your cleavage, or perhaps I will with my face. The decadent, the decadent south. south. A huge thing his entire time is the decadent south and the decadent gods or the decadent south and they're shitty men. To be fair, they do have shitty men for the most part. When they were in the library, he discovers that it's been 500, uh, 450 years that he's been in the sword. Uh, and that the one of his previous uh, owners slash masters like lived a good life and his land and property is still uh, surviving, which is a nice touch because we get some little tidbits from Sarkis's point of view into some of his previous masters, some of the stuff. And there are some nice parts of it. Again, it's real dark. And he basically is told Hala, and I need to mention this because it's going to work for our terrible third act breakup. Uh, uh, I hate it. Um, he basically told Hala, I was a part of a mercenary band. I fought for my country. And then it, as we were losing. So in, in an attempt to help them, me and my two captains were sealed into swords to be used as weapons to help in the fight. But I don't know if it worked. I have an issue, not with that, with um, Hela even being offended by this. Hela is not a gallant knight. Hella is not chivalry is important. Uh, loyalty um, of warriors. Above stuff. all. Like, this was 500 years ago. Hella would have been like, oh, well. And then start ask questions about the whole situation. She would not have started crying and w- run away. We'll get there when we get there. But it's, it's, it, this, this is what he's told her. And uh, there's a lot of points throughout the book where she's like, he's a hero. Of course he would do that. He's a hero. And it, it, it happens enough times that you're like, okay, f- like, it just, it doesn't work. But anyway, so um, they continue, they, the temple basically was like, we will provide you a lawyer to come and fight your case. We will take 20% of your inheritance to do so. You also, because the, the bishop, uh, Bertong, is like, you don't need us. You can do this on your own. It might be harder, and we are happy to help, but, like, I am, le- like, obligated to tell you. And she's like, no, 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 I will take you. And she's like, good, we will assign a priest to travel with you and arrange travel things, so just wait until then. So, the, like, next day after they've been staying at this inn, um, also, I should say, he he sleeps on the floor in between her and the door a lot. So we never have the shared bed trope. Yeah, we never have the shared bed trope. And like, let me tell you, I thought this book was gonna like subvert, like it was going to look the third act misunderstanding in the face and then just have Hala go, why would I care? Because there are so many tropes, like there's so many times where the book gets close to a romantic trope and then it goes, tee hee hee, I'm not doing it. Oh God, once you told me, Maria told me that you guys had said in the Discord that the the third act fell apart uh, a bit. And once I looked at the audiobook and I saw two hours and 45 minutes left and they had just solved the law thing, I was like, please. For the love of God, do not do... I thought, I hopefully, dreamily thought that it would uh, concern itself with, uh, what was it, Nolan. Uh, Nolan's stuff, and, like, it was going to get into more of, you know, I don't know, some other, like... Having him just get in stolen and her have to rescue him would have been really fucking cool. We didn't need the rest of it. Priest comes and it turns out it's Zale, the priest that they first spoke to, because Zale is like, that was super fascinating. I'm in. I don't actually do inheritance law, but I do do property law, so I'll do my best. And with Zale is coming a knoll. And uh, the knolls are like these badger people um, that uh, appeared like 15 years ago, and they do certain jobs. And our knoll, Brindle, is an ox caretaker. Um, And like, 
Uh, he like takes care of the wagon, takes care, and he's just mwah. He's the best. Anol knows his mind. A prime, well-rounded side character. My God, what a beautifully accented like. We've got a language thing. We've got a, a hint to his lifestyle. We've got a personality that only slowly blooms out of professionalism with the right plot points that endear him to those people. Mm -hmm. um, we have him kill someone immediately in defense, which really defines, there's so many great, and then also the fact that he takes it upon himself to lift the, the weird jelly thing um, as they go through, rather than Sarkis, which made no sense to me. Um, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. Um, but I, I just, God, what a great character. That character did not disappoint me at any point. And I thought he was, because at first I felt, I thought he was just going to be a caricature. Uh, and then he ended up having way more depth. So I was pleasantly surprised. Um, so Lindbergh makes a comment. Uh, this book made me appreciate just what a banger of a book God Killer was. Katie, that's another one you have to read. It was so nice. Well, I did read the first fourth it of was the book. but so good. Please read it. They continue back on to, back to now that this book is a lot of doing this on the road. Like if you thought Mad Max Fury Road <laughs> had a lot of back and forth, this has it one more time extra. This is when this happens. So I think it's appropriate for me to bring it up. How did you feel about the peeing in a jar scene? I didn't love it. Like I, so there's this idea that Hala and Sarkis, not Hala and Sarkis, Hala and Zale are very inquisitive uh, people who like to know how things work. And so they start going through things like, uh, you, because somebody says something about like, have you ever lost a limb? And he's like, yeah, my tongue got cut out, but it would go back. And they were like, but did your tongue go back in the sword with you? These are and all great questions. And so there's an entire chunk of the book where it's just them trying to go through what happens to bits of Sarkis. And I, the, the thing is in retrospect, it really felt like just a dynamic to justify them having sex without having to worry about children. No, it was, it was, it was, but it, it, it was a plot point, everyone. This was, this, this had a committed scene to it and a committed piece of dialogue, which granted, I appreciated how baldly she did this and how it made sense with Hela as a character and with Zayn or Zayla as a character. But at the same time, it's like, these are the types of questions that books typically don't address. <laughs> so for a reason. Um, but I did think it was really funny that when he went back in and the pee disappeared, they were just like, oh, very interesting. And then they started doing experiments on him with like the porridge and stuff, which honestly, I don't know why Sarkis went along with it. In his character model, I don't feel like at this point in time, he would have dawdled with them on this. And I don't know why it needed to happen. He could always be like, it, 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 the thing is, at the end of the book, when she was like, listen, I don't want kids, he could have just been like, listen, every time I go back in the sword, everything that is me or was part of me goes with me. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That's all we needed. We did not need a scene showing us. His jizz inside of her deep cave uh, just goes blue, uh, does can you see through her skin the blue glow of it disappearing? <laughs> Does it hurt and or feel good? I, I, maybe that could be a whole kink where immediately after he comes, in order to make her come, they just sheath the sword and it's like, ah! <laughs> Oh God, I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> Will is going to be so angry <laughs> that he didn't read this book. I think it's so dumb that they had that seat. I mean, it's look, I, so I certainly there are other medicines that she can chew on that like or whatever or drink in a tea that could have easily explained that away. We did not have to. But again, he could have just said every time I go back into the sword, everything like he could find this. He could know this already. Like he could just have this information. Maybe he boinked some of it. Oh, actually, no, that doesn't work out. But like maybe he had sex when he was with the what was it called? The 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 young leopard. Like maybe he had sex during that time and he never got anyone pregnant. It, there are so many other ways she could have done it, but she went in for the comedy, which again, I can't say I dislike it, but man, wild. It's a choice, but they do it and it's it's for science. 
It's for the quest of knowledge. Continuing. Um, on their road, on their trip back to uh, her hometown, they keep getting stopped by, and this was something that uh, Sarkis and her got stopped by uh, going towards. There is this other religious group that we've mentioned, the Hanged Mother, and the priests of the Hanged Mother are dicks. They they, they don't like the priesthood of the rats because uh, they are they're like they really they're going for monotheism and they're really mad that there's so many other religions that they have to compete with. They just keep fucking up, like f- showing up and being like, but like, how do they keep? Getting ahead of them. I think they just rode off in, a, 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 like, a certain direction. But they didn't say, because, like, for them to get ahead of them, they would have had to travel in the same direction as them. How do they keep getting ahead of them, Katie? Do they have floating horses? Are there magical portal points? Maybe what happened was they were like, ah, oh, shit, we're behind them, but we want to be, like, really impressive. So maybe they, like, went into the woods and, like, circumvented Ran them. Pell-mell. and then And then, like, started, like, and then, like, you know, fluffed themselves up and were like, if they're going straight on a road, it's just a road going straight. And these same two priests just keep coming up and being like, yo, what the fuck are you doing here? This is our road. And Zale is like, nah, you don't own this road. We have an agreement. I'm here on Temple of the Right White Rat business. Like, you got... You got nothing. That was the whole point of the painted, like, thing. And also, again... You know when the band... So, okay, so this happens, and I'm getting just a tiny bit ahead, but... Uh, later down the line, after this whole thing happens and a couple other things, they also get stopped by bandits. The whole point of having the painted wagon was so that everyone could be like, that's the white rat. We don't touch this thing. And yet when the bandits were there, somebody shot at Sarkis and then they were like, he's like, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a priest from the temple of the white rat. And they're like, you shot a white rat priest? And I'm like, the wagon, the wagon is literally painted. Yeah, so and, and the the reason they're attacked by the bandits is the bandits they were attacked that just Sarkis and Hallow were attacked with. Two of the bandits that attacked them previously, uh, one of them saw Sarkis pop out of a flipping sword and didn't see him pop out of a sword, but saw that all there was no man there, and all of a sudden blue flames appeared, and then a man appeared. So that bandit assumes that Hallow is a witch. And magic user, they use it like the a wonder worker who can make people invisible, and they would like that for their banditry. And so the sh- that lady convinces um, uh, her entire bandit group, Mina, the shitty Mina, convinces her entire bandit group to attack them. And like her bandit leader did not want to do this. I thought he was great, by the way, as a side note. He feels more complex than a lot of the other characters we deal with. So they get attacked by bandits. They keep getting harassed by these priests. Eventually, there's a showdown with the priests where like Hala, one of them pushes Hala away from them and it, it causes her to fall and trip and hurt herself, which gets Sarkis all like up at arms and he ends up dueling with the one guy. The other uh, priest is like, I'm gonna help my friend and then brindle who at this point has been just really focused on the ox and making lots of comments about how humans don't know shit just like as sarkis runs the one guy through with his sword brindle shoots the other one in the throat and halla and zale are like we have bodies so then they have to go on a quest to get rid of the bodies i love how zale throws up and she holds his hair or their hair back excuse me excuse me uh it's just because the the voice actress made uh them sound masculine so i keep going with that but anyway um or i guess you could argue that but anyway the point is though is i love how she held their hair back what <laughs> bobby i'm like oh what a bonding what a bonding experience i also love how zale was like i'm going to go pray and then just throws up and comes back and feel like, I feel much more time to. What a great character. Yes, really enjoy Zale as a character. And it's, it, again, if the level of nuance and interestingness to this character, these characters were just expanded a little bit. This book could have been, could have been great. Anyway, um, so they have to dispose of the bodies and they're like, what are we going to do? They put the bodies in the wagon because they're like, listen, we need to cover this up as quickly as possible. We got to get rid of this because the hanged mother's priests are real dicks and they are, uh, they're, they're pains in the butt. And so they can't know that we killed two of their priests. We're going to have a huge issue. So they use Sarkis because he can only go so far away from the sword before he'll poof back into the sword. So Sarkis goes and takes the horses as far away as he can. And then, uh poofs back in and they go 
do, 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 uh, in a different direction. Uh, and then they end up all together again. This is, I think, the point at which the, the bandits come, but whatever. Yeah, or no, they have an interaction with a farmer. That's what it is. And they, they get real the girl the uh halla and sale get real squirrely and like hey, trying to act normal but they all end up back in the wagon and they're like we have to get rid of the bodies and halla has the bright idea that why don't we go into the woods that the people the farmers take their hogs into the acorn woods look for a pond uh and just shove them under the water the water is about to freeze it's still really slushy if we've cut a hole in the top ice we can shove them in so they do this they find a little path into the woods and they start going in they find a little pond it takes a very long time they shove the bodies in put some straw on top and then they're like okay now to get out but they were like we have to keep going forward because there's nowhere big enough for them to turn the wagon around which they're hoping to find but then they end up in the what were they called again katie the vagrant hills the vagrant hills and earlier in the book uh halla mentions the vagrant hills is this weird place with weird creatures in it that like can snatch you if you get too close and that's what happens they get too close to the vagrant hills even though based on halla's uh knowledge they are way too far north but evidently the vagrant hills are uh warm for sarkis's form and wanted to get a closer look if you will so they oh. snatch him in and the farther away they get from their world and into the Vagrant Hills, the less, like, autumn it is and the more uh, summery it gets. And they end up having a weird night where there's these weird, like, hyena-sounding creatures, but they're actually squirrels. And then there's these weird, like, globby, see-through, clear uh, monsters that will, like, land on you and try to get inside you and, like, feed off of you from the inside. Uh, and there's, like, a zombie deer with one of them on it. And they have to get out. And they end up getting out. Oh, no, while they're there, they meet the Rune. And the Rune are a, like, group of people who are stag people. Which I thought was quite cool. Um, and before we continue, I want you to guess what this is. If anybody wants to put uh, guesses on... I drink one of these every single day. It's an addiction. It's pickle juice. I lived with this woman, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, this pickle juice is so damn good. You guys are just- I you all lived with this woman. So uh, they have a whole conversation with the rune and the rune are basically like, the sword is your house. And uh, there's a translator, a human translator who lives with the rune who comes and like is translating back and forth. And basically they do, they're like, Sarkis, you live in a sword house. Would you like to get out of the sword house? We can help. And he was like, yeah, and and then he's like, but not yet. Because he's like, he's like, at some point I'd like to die. I've been alive a really long time. I'd like the sweet release of death at some point. Uh, and Hal is sitting there like, and he's like, not now. N not now. Once they get towards death's door, or she does, and she's a, a little old lady, maybe she'll want to go on one last adventure there and back again. And they can go over to the Vagrant Hills and uh, he can die alongside with her. Like the notebook, except they took that ending out of the movie. It doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, Lindbergh says, I don't know if your pickle juice is different from ours because ours is very vinegary. You're oh, it's the yeah, same no. pickle juice. Lindbergh, it's the same. It's garlicky. There's garlic chunks in here that I'm eating. Uh, comboed with, it's, it's just straight vinegar. Uh, but it's like, oh, God, I love pickles. Lindbergh says, I don't know why you drink that unless you're a body ready for embalming. <laughs> <laughs> the brine. Yes, the brine. This is sequel bait where the author is like, look, there's a potential way to, to, to get him out of the sword. Uh, we're going to leave this here. And then we're just going to leave it. To be fair, that's smart. Yes, it is. If you're doing a series. Again, I will argue, I like me a standalone book. And I think this could have just been a really nice, cute standalone book that didn't need to be like a ton of stuff i i really wonder what the like goal of the and it also would have made some of the like cutesy stuff a little bit more tolerable to just have it as its own little cute so they leave the vagrant hills they end up getting to her town and basically zale goes in lawyers it up and is like get those people out of here you never should have let them in it's not there because They've been telling everyone that Halla was kidnapped and Halla's like, uh, I'm not, obviously not. And they were like, uh, they go to the clerk of the town and Zale is like, uh, so the documents seem clear. This is Halla's. And he, the clerk is like, well, there's been a, they're contesting the will. And she's like, so the house and all of the property has been sealed up while we arbitrate. And they're like, no. And she's like, or 
excuse me, in my head, I, I don't know. Zale always felt a little more feminine to me. And so in my head, I, if I mess up, but for the most part, they, um, uh, they're like, uh, why didn't you do that? That's super like against the code, get your shit together. And so immediately they seal up the house, uh, Malva and, uh, Alver are super uh, upset about the whole, like they're just being such potatoes. And eventually they have a trial and Hala gets the house and everyone's really happy. Now the entire time on the way towards um, uh, the their little her little village, he has been thinking, Sarkis has been thinking, I need to tell her the truth of what is written on the sword and how I ended up in the sword, but I need to tell her at a point where she has all of her power and she's no longer obligated or like feels like she needs me to help her. Um, and so basically he doesn't want to, number one, say, I like you, will you go out with me? Or say, here's my actual history that I didn't tell you at a point where she still needs him to make sure she gets her inheritance. He wants her to be set up safe so that there is no power dynamic where she still needs him uh, that causes her to say something that she wouldn't actually say. Or to give him up and put him away when he could still be helping her and make sure that she gets what she needs. But either way, like, what you make sense? You know, like, I, I get that, but also simultaneously, she would not, she should not have even cared anyway. This as a concept I like because you do want someone to be in, like, the best position for, for themselves before you ask something like that of them. But uh, anyway, so once everything gets sorted uh, and she gets to be in her, the house again, uh, her and him get Randy. There's a point back when they were in Anuket City where he kissed her and she was into it, but then he stopped and he was like, I shouldn't have done that. And she's like, will you do it again? And he's like, not without your permission, which would, if you were anyone else, would be like, you have it. Well, Let's yeah, exactly. Go. She, there, it doesn't make any sense. That she I mean, it does. Like, I guess, he's not I guess it does. No, well, no, no. It does to some degree because she's an idiot when it comes to herself. And there are people that are like that to some degree. But that permission thing in particular really should have hit home for her and been like oh well then <laughs> i get to decide whether more of this happens let me or not let i am in control maybe she didn't want to think she wasn't totally sure if she wanted it at first and that's why it doesn't happen for a while but then she moves in later and that's the permission blah 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 you know like that would make sense that's not what happens instead he says the you know i won't do it again without your permission and she's like he's obviously not into me <laughs> My whatever heart. that's so uh, dumb like zale knows they're into each other uh brindle knows they're into each other brindle can smell it yeah brindle's like a human doesn't smell good and you're like oh no brindle i'm so sorry i hate every time in a book someone uses the term i could smell their arousal murder me well look to be fair I no no no. You don't like the smell of arousal. You don't know what the smell. Of, you like no 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 no. I like. That's not the smell of arousal. Will edit that out, please. Hey, you can't say that on the internet. Listen, you are scarring <laughs> some people. Sorry, guys. I'm just I'm Poor just fucking angry pulling your butt. And ice willow, you are sorry. Too. Sorry, everyone. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but not really. Wait, was that you that t are you? Wait, you just got, wait, you're muted. He's, no, he's not in the room. He just came in to see stuff. Like, he's he's watching from the YouTube live stream. He's not in here. <laughs> well, we don't know she hasn't drunk anything. Besides pickle juice. <laughs> God, you came in at the right moment. Can I get here to hear about Katie's it is an obsession. obsession. Yeah, Angry Otter says they can't be trusted, Will. Apparently we can't. And get out. Will, this is girls talk, by the way. <laughs> get out, Will. Yes, the stream isn't the stream for you. Isn't for you. <laughs> let's refocus hard. Yeah, okay, let's keep going. So, and there's literally a point where Zale talks to Sarkis and is like, yo, she's been into you this whole time. And then when uh, Zale also talks to homegirl Hala, and it's like, yo, he kind of into you. And so, like, the two are potatoes. But anyway, they get her house back, they do the smushings, uh, and they don't do it because she's afraid of getting pregnant, so he's like, there are other things we can do, and she's like, I didn't know there were other things. What we other things? So they do the other things, and it's not an explicit scene, you get, like, dialogue. Which I like. I liked that a lot. Yes. Yep. It made it elegant. I, I, I really dislike, for example, 
like in the cyborg tinkerer where they're just yes. like let me sit on your face um and then this like or please sit on my face like it's just it's almost like comedically disgusting and it totally shames in my eyes the characters like not like they feel shame as in like it takes away from the elegance of their portrayal and their build up and everything and it almost feels like oh the real characters exist but here let me give you a pornography version of those characters, characters. in a dumb situation like like watching the spider-man porn where, porn where like the two spider-mans are on each other and then like the one goes on the butt cheeks i'm glad it wasn't explicit i'm glad it kept to itself a bit we get a little bit more from uh sarkis's when it switches back to his point of view at one point as far as but more in a tender way than a gross way but anyway the next day he's literally like i have to tell her everything they're, they're like having breakfast and he's like no i have to tell her now so he takes a sword and he goes to um so i should mention that when they were going back to um uh her hometown they and they passed through um the city where Bartholomew lived again, they went to see him and was, were like, hey, would you write a letter saying um, that uh, Silas was in his right mind when he wrote his will and that you've seen him and it was fine. And Silas was like, yeah, I'm, or Bartholomew was like, I'll do you one better. I'll go as well. I'll travel after you guys and then I will testify at the um, like meeting. And Zale was like, perfect. So Bartholomew and a scholar named Nolan have come along for this. And Nolan is in the like sitting room kind of reading some stuff. And uh, Sarkis comes in. And uh, also, I should mention that previously when they were in Anoket City, they got attacked by someone wanting the girl with the sword. And you're immediately like, oh, Bartholomew hired some thugs. Of course. Like, it's it's very obvious that he's in on it. Bartholomew hired some hugs to try to get... Th- Hugs. Some hugs. <laughs> Some, Some thugs hugs. to try get the uh, sword from uh, Hala because he wants it. And so you're like, oh, this can't go well. And I was I, I was expecting it to happen sooner than it did. But anyway, um, so Nolan, the scholar, is like sitting there and he's reading and Sarkis comes in and he's like, read this sword. Can you read it? And he was like, actually, I do happen to know the script this was written in. And it basically says, this is the punishment and prison of the traitor Sarkis. And she's like, you're a train. You've lied to me this whole time. You're no hero. You're actually awful. Boo hoo. In fact, Sarkis, even though I know that this could put you in a bad position for someone so smart, she's being certainly dumb. I give you to yourself and then, and then walks away. And not just that, but like he explains to her that like, he was the head of a mercenary group. He cared about his men more so than, like, the governments that hired him. Why would she care about the government that hired him? And when it looked like the side he was fighting for was going to lose, he chose to betray that side to save his men and go to the other side. What he didn't know is that the other side, the first side that he'd been on's reinforcements were going to come in two days, and they ended up winning anyway. So his entire mercenary band, except for him and his two captains were just killed straight out like a, a, a normal death and then the punishment that Sarkis and his two captain, uh, captains Angharad and uh, the Dervish were put to were being trapped in swords for eternity by this like really good wonder worker who was also a swordsmith and so like this was the punishment but like you hear it and you're like oh he wasn't working for selfish reasons he wanted to take care of his men and he didn't want them to get like captured and she's like how dare you tell me you let me think I you were a hero and he was like yes i knew what you thought and i i didn't disillusion you i lied to you it was so malicious of me oh and instead of right then and there just being like i did this because of this reason otherwise i would have been fine with and on top of that she would have been like let's go get some tea and talk about this like she would not have run off in a flurry of tears it seems so and as soon as that's when i turned the book into two times the speed and started fast forwarding through things because I was like, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear it. It's dumb. And it immediately gets resolved on her end so quickly. Cause again, like why have this moment if like, Oh God, it's, it's so annoying. It is the most annoying part of the book. And, and I've obviously had some critiques up to this point, but it's so stupid. And she literally, like Katie said, it's like, you can be your own. You're not mine anymore. Fuck you. You own yourself. Meanwhile, super dumb because like, how can a sword? Cause like the whole point is whoever unsheaths the sword next is now going to be his master. How is he supposed to unsheath the sword, madam? But anyway, she does that, throws him on the table, and goes out to cry, like, in in her garden, like, and stomp around. 
And by the time she comes back, she's like, listen, I, I've worked like I know he, he's done a lot of things that make me know that he is not that person and yada, yada, yada. Maybe I should just like uh, I'm not ready to forgive him, but let me talk to him. Meanwhile, after she did that, then she threw the sword on the table. Bartholomew uh, comes and unsheaths it and is like, I'm now your owner, bitch. And Nolan is like, you weren't supposed to open the sword. And basically what you find out is Nolan and Bartholomew, Nolan is a priest of this temple of the sacred smith or whatever it's called. Um, and it's basically the smith who made Sarkis into a sword. That is their god. And so he they want the sword for them as a relic because it's it is a relic of her work. I mean, look, that makes perfect sense. And really, that should have started that particular line of plot seven chapters in, eight chapters, ten chapters in, and should have been an undercurrent underplot that wheedled its way in throughout the book and been a problem from there. It's like you're writing an essay, and then one of your most persuasive parts of your essay. You don't put it in your thesis, you don't hint at it throughout the first several paragraphs, but then the paragraph before the conclusion, you're like, but you know what, let me shove you all of this information that was really important and could have really made my previous point super persuasive, but no, I'm not going to incorporate it there. Instead, I'm going to slap you in the face like a pie, and then I'm going to conclude everything. And also, tell me how, because like, the other religious orders are pretty familiar with the other religious orders. How come Zale or uh, Bear Tongue weren't like, wow, this sounds like the working of that one swordsmith god? They solve it by saying, uh, having Nolan say, we're quite obscure. But you're telling me none of the other sects the know white you rat exist, would. but the white rat would. You know? Yeah, I feel like the white rat would. Like, like there should be something about we like we've heard tell of a the and and you know, it could even be a throwaway line of Braveheart being like. I have a source that might know more about this. I'm going to uh, touch base with a different religious order. And her being like, this sounds like something of, you know, the the sainted smith. That's what it's called. Um, but anyway, so Nolan wants it. But then when Bartholomew draws it, that means that uh, Sarkis is now under Bartholomew's control. And Nolan's upset because that was not the deal. It was supposed to go to them. He was going to sell it to them. It was never part of the deal for Bartholomew to become the sword uh, wielder. Uh, Sargus immediately is like trying to fuck shit up, but he can't. The magic of the sword literally makes it that he cannot um, mess with the uh, the person who is wielding. He has to protect the person, um, and so uh, he kind of has to, like gets resigned to his fate. And he's like, also, Hal hates me, so like, what does it matter? Let me just go off with these two. But then because he she that she gave uh, yeah yeah. And also, what Bartholomew and uh, Nolan should have both they're both clever old men why didn't they just say she gave you to us or so or something like that and that they and why did bartholomew even mention the cousin or anything like that because then that's gonna make sarkis directly oppose them why wouldn't they uh, build a lie that seemed so i'm sorry lazy amateur yeah um, but anyway, he's like, we'll leave uh, Hala to the 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 man. And, and Sarkis is like, what man? And they were like, oh, her cousin Alvar. We've been working together the whole time. And she's too uh, bird brain to take care of everything on her own. She needs a man to help her. And I'm like, fuck you, Bartholomew. Like, what a flattening of any interesting stuff this could have been. But anyway, so they fudge off. Hala eventually comes back and is like... They're gone. What happened? And then Alvar's there and he's like, your sword boyfriend, well, no, he doesn't know he's from a sword. And he's like, your god boyfriend left with uh, Bartholomew and Nolan and he just left you. And she's like, great. He just left me on top of being a liar. Like he just walked out. And I'm like, you literally left you are the so sword. Dumb. Why are you being dumb? Like you were, you've been smarter than this at multiple points in the book. Why are you doing this? They capture her, Alvin. Like, she ends up just back tied up in the house again. And Alva and Malva are like, you're gonna marry point, But this time she has Zale because Zale was in the attic looking through the assets uh, and was in the house. And so Zale is also tied up. So the two of them 
work together to kind of get out of their ties. Uh, Alver comes up and they, and again, this would have been such a great opportunity for Alver to become like, 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 hey, I'm going to cut you loose. I thought that's when it was going to happen. I thought this was the moment. But instead, she stabs Alver. <laughs> Which I'm fine with, too, I guess. Like, yeah, they end up escaping. She stabs Alver, uh, smacks Malva. Like, th- there's a whole fight. And they end up escaping. And they're like, ah, oh, he's probably been taken. Like, th- and now they're, uh, like, we have to go help him. And so now they're they're going pell-mell. But they're also still in the wagon with the ox, with Brindle. And so they end up back at the um, inn where she originally got uh, conned by Mina, the bandit who attacked her. And they're there and they're like, man, uh, you know, what are we going to do? And there happens to be three paladins. And one of the things you learn here is that all the priests and uh, workers for the different religions love gossiping together. So they see the three paladins are for the dream god, which is a god that like they, the paladins deal with killing demons. Um, and Zale basically says they're all very good looking and they all are kind of dumb and they just, and they're real good at stabbing demons and that's about it. Uh, and so they end up sitting at the table with them. Hala ends up helping the one, he he had a wound and she like cleans it and helps take care of it because she used to work on a farm and can kind of do that stuff. And they're like kind of, uh, the one is kind of flirty and she's like, hey. <laughs> uh, and then they get a, they get stopped by the fucking uh, hanged mother people again, and they're being really. They're like some bandits told us you are a witch. It was very gratifying to have legit paladins just be like, "Step off my front porch, my god!" Like that was so delightful, though, even though it was completely unnecessary. Because there's this whole scene where like the hanged mother people are like, "Some bandits told us you killed our two missing brethren," and why would you believe? bandits like which which hella points out like that makes no sense and uh, and then the three paladins that they saw at the place were like hey step off go away um and then they were like hey you're probably gonna get harassed again do you want like do you need to get somewhere fast and they were like yeah we actually do and they were like well it's gonna take you forever with an ox you want some horses so basically the injured paladin and brindle and the ox stay back um and are gonna go slowly and the rest of them get on horses and ride to um bartholomew's house um as they get there the next time sarkis is taken out of the blade uh he wakes up and bartholomew's dead nolan is now master of the thing and he recognizes in nolan the same kind of calculating lack of consciousness or morality that he saw in the swordsmith who Mm -hmm. put him in here she was kind of like progress for progress's sake regardless of the human cost kind of vibes is what you get and this priest of her order obviously has that and he calls it that it's a a term for the specific type of like mindset um and he sees it in nolan and then uh who should bust in but hala because she happens to know where the extra key is kept because it's like no one's like the door is locked um and they have a showdown and basically zale and hala have kind of decided that one of them is gonna have to kill someone to kind of get out of this situation um and zale's like listen it's my word defending you is worth more than your word defending me uh so you're gonna have to do it and previously uh zale had been teaching hala how to use a crossbow so hala comes in with like a cloak over her shoulder and basically like exposes the crossbow at nolan sarkis is like i will literally if you try to attack him i will have to attack you and like it starts happening where he has to like push a table at her and she's like you know don't worry like just fight it and he's like i literally can't and then he's sitting there and he's like after this is done i'm going to kill nolan i'm going to somehow i'm going to find him and i'm going to kill him and then he realizes in that moment i'm the greatest threat to nolan so then he gets to he he falls on his sword and he, yes. cause, uh, we haven't mentioned this, but if he dies, he just goes back into the sword for a while. And after two weeks, he'll pop back out. So he dies, pops back into the sword. And she's like, no, why would you do that? Why would you kill yourself for me? That was so unnecessary. And he's like, it was the only way, babe. And then they do it. Not yet. She she actually, she shoots Nolan. Uh, and then um, she uses incompetence to threaten him into uh, giving her the sword he gives it to her um they get nolan arrested they go back to 
the town. She gets settled and up. And then, lo and behold, she inherits all of uh, Bartholomew's stuff. And... Because he left Silas as the person to get his... But yeah, so all of that happens. So she's, like, she's hella rich. She got money. But anyway, uh, so after she waits two weeks, he pops out of the sword, and they're like, I love you. And then he I pops into her. And basically, they decide they're going to get married, but he has some notions about getting married where in his plant his his from his society you pay the bride's family to marry the bride and here where Halla lives the bride has to have a dowry to give to you and um one of the things that circus mentions uh is that in his world you still get the money like it goes to the the house bride like so she still has like you still have it um, but it's like about a status thing and he wants to make sure her status is like well represented. So he ends up working out with Dale and then getting some money and then like they get married. And then in the, in the epilogue of the book, uh, they find out uh, the, they get a message from Zale that Nolan had been uh, before he died, had been uh, interrogated and basically said it doesn't matter that they didn't get Sarkis. They, are, they came into possession of a second sword. And now it's like, oh, my God, is this is it the dervis and Karad? yeah is it one of his captains that he has been you know so guilty about for this whole time getting them trapped in swords um and so you know the next book is going to be about them getting the swords and that this is my prediction for the series it's going to be a book or two about them getting the other swords and then a book about getting him out of the sword if she's smart, that's just going to be one book and it'll be a duology. But I don't know. Who am I? I I'm pretty sure Lindbergh and Ice Willow, I'm pretty sure it was just he was being like old fashioned. That's basically the gist of it. It's like, we don't need a ring to get married, but I want to give you one anyway. That type of thing. You know what I mean? Anyway, it's silly. And I think it was just to like honor her that she was a woman of worth and he wanted everyone to know that she was of worth, which again, silly. And unnecessary. You are literally a sword man who cannot age. I don't know why we are using. Why normal. isn't he just paying with his service? Like he is going to protect her yeah. the rest of his unnatural life. That in and of itself is priceless. So there you have it. That is sword heart. Miss Ally Snow says. Uh, now I bet there'll be two books about the other two swords. And who they're who they're for? for. <laughs> yeah. God, I hope not. I hope it's just like a clean duology, and it just like wraps it up. Oh, I doubt it. Valerie says, "I loved it. Everyone, leave me alone." Look, I loved it too. That was fine. It just you yeah. can still critique it as all. Like, I mean, it's critiquable just like anything else. But I thoroughly enjoyed it. The only part I didn't like was basically once she got the the like the law was on her side and she got her house back onwards that all that just was very it just felt very unnatural and contrived in comparison to everything else but otherwise characters were absolutely stellar i absolutely loved uh the lineup and it was really fun honestly it's it was kind of like it was kind of like having um a palate cleanser, I guess. And listen, it was it was for me this is like my kind of beach read where this is the level of cuz like listen, it's not like when Katie said like Fourth Wing's a beach read. Fourth Wing is so like you have to turn your you there's a level of turning your brain off to enjoy Fourth Wing that I just physically cannot do. And this book is the level of turning my brain off that I can do while still going oh. Hey. Anyway, thank you for joining us, guys. As usual, you are amazing. Uh, you're, like, my favorite part of this podcast, to be honest. I'm so hungry. Okay, okay. I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go feed Katie. I love you all, and good night.